Hi, welcome to the first video in a dashboard December series. This series is going to cover my entire dashboard in depth, a couple pages at a time. I'll show you what it looks like, how it works, and the code that makes it go. In this video, I'm going to give you an overview of the whole thing so you can get an idea of the types of stuff I'll be covering as the month progresses. Let's get started. First things first, I'm not saying that my dashboard is the best. I'm not saying this is how you should design your dashboard. My goal with this video series is to simply give you an in-depth tour of what I did to help show what's possible and to give you some ideas for things that you may want to do in your own dashboard. I hope that I'm able to give you some new ideas that you haven't thought of. And if you happen to find one or two cool things to add to your dashboard, I'll be happy. Let's get into the dashboard. Here we've got the main page of my dashboard. I had three goals in mind when I designed my dashboard. First, I wanted to keep scrolling to a minimum on mobile devices, as much as I could anyway with the amount of stuff that I have. Second, I wanted to use adult sized buttons for everything. In other words, I didn't want the buttons and switches to be so small that my fat fingers would accidentally turn on my wife's nightstand light when I was trying to turn mine off. Hmm, you guys keep catching me with this eggnog. Sorry, it's good. Third, I wanted everything to be organized and easy to find, and I wanted all the stuff to be displayed on the dashboard, even if a lot of it is controlled automatically, and I literally never touch those buttons, just in case, you know? So the way I accomplished this was to break stuff up and make nested pages. As you can see, on the first row, we've got main floor, second floor, and basement. We'll start with the main floor. Clicking on that will show you all the rooms on the main floor of the house. At the top, we've got some pretty good high-level information, including some temperature information, the state of all the leak sensors on the first floor, and the number of lights that are currently on on the main floor. In the garage, we've got temperature and humidity, contact sensors on the two service doors, and buttons for the lights and garage door. In the scullery, we've got temperature and humidity, and a contact sensor on the door and a button for the light. For the rear foyer, we've got a couple of lights and a contact sensor on the entry door from the garage. The half bath has a leak sensor, a light, and a fan. The kitchen has temperature and humidity, the temperatures for the fridge and freezer, water leak detectors for both sinks, and a couple contact sensors. We've also got buttons to control the overhead lights, a smart outlet, and a button for the back door lock. In addition, we've got a small display for the kitchen security camera, as well as controls for the in-ceiling speakers, which are part of the whole home audio setup. The parlor has temp and humidity, a smart outlet, and a couple smart bulbs. Now, I really don't like using smart bulbs, but it's a floor lamp with individually switched bulb sockets. So there's no other good way to control each light separately with a wall switch. That would just be all or nothing, so. For those of you balking already about how will guests control the lights, the parlor light turns on automatically at sunset and there's a smart button in the parlor. Press it once for one bulb at 50% brightness, press it twice for both bulbs with the second bulb being at 100% brightness and hold it to turn the lamp off. In addition, this can be controlled via the tablet mounted to the wall in the kitchen, but now we're getting off topic. See, the fact that I even had to address this is one of the huge reasons why I hate using smart bulbs in public areas of the house. Moving right along, the dining room has a chandelier and in-ceiling speakers, and the front foyer has a few lights, a lock, and a contact sensor. The sunroom has lights, a ceiling fan, an outlet, and a camera. And last on this floor, in the den, we've got ceiling fan and lights, a fan for the fireplace, an outlet, some can lights in the ceiling, and here again, we've got controls for a whole home audio and a security camera. For those of you wondering about the outlets, they remain plugged in all the time, even if there's nothing plugged into them. There are Sonoff Zigbee outlets that serve as repeaters for my Zigbee network, and when they're in use, it's typically stuff like Christmas lights and other decorations. 
Same idea for the second floor. All the temperatures are displayed on chips, as well as the state of all the water leak sensors. And each room has a button that'll show you all the things that are in that room. It's laid out pretty similarly to the main floor. So in the interest of keeping this overview brief, we'll skip digging into each one. The one area that I do want to show real fast before we move on though, is the hallway. In the hallway, we've got the lights, the chandelier over the stairs, lights in the laundry closet and the linen closet, and the washer and dryer. When we're doing laundry, it tells us what cycle it's on, as well as gives us a countdown of how much time is remaining until it completes. Of course, then I've got some automations that send us notifications when that cycle is done. It, it's great. Our washer and dryer are made by LG, and there's an integration that I use to get them into the dashboard here. I already made a video about that, so if you're interested, check the description for a link to learn how to set that up. We'll dig into this a bit more in an upcoming episode, so be sure to watch for that. Next up is the basement. You'll notice that button is colored yellow. That's because there's lights on down here. That's right. Any floor or room where lights are on will be colored so that I can tell at a glance where there are lights on. Again, you'll see that my office is colored, which makes sense since I'm currently in here making videos. Now for the basement, the top four buttons are rooms and the rest are just buttons that control individual items. Starting at the top of the page, you can see there are three lights on in my office and then the temperature chips, a contact sensor on the egress window and some leak detectors. This page is actually missing a couple lights that I added just before filming this talking headshot here, but they'll be included in the deep dive section when we get to my office, don't you worry. The missing lights are Govi LED floor lamps on either side of my desk here behind me. I caught them on Amazon's Black Friday sale for a really good deal, and integrating them with Home Assistant was a breeze. But back to the dashboard. On the main page, next up is the backyard. In the backyard, we've got buttons for three different sets of floodlights, controls for a whole home audio channel that drives the deck speakers, and a couple of cameras and a doorbell camera. You'll notice that there are also alert images to the right of each camera. These are static images that show me the last alert that was fired by my security system. For my NVR and image detection and alerting system, I'm using Blue Iris and DeepStack, which I already made a three-part installation and configuration video series about. So if you're interested in learning more about that, I'll throw a link to part one in the description. Next up is the front yard. Same idea as the back, some buttons for lighting, a couple cameras, and their alert images. Driveway is more of the same. Lights, camera, action, Gotcha, alert images. The security page shows the state of all my contact sensors, all my exterior person detection sensors, which are deep stack AI person detection notifications from the cameras, as well as a bunch of security controls. Leaving neighborhood has been discussed in a previous video, but basically it overrides the automatic garage door open close and also overrides the firewall port forwarding automations to make sure that the former stays closed and the latter does not. The exterior motion button disables the exterior motion sensors, which is helpful if we're hanging out on the back deck after dark, or if I get home after dark and don't need the whole place to be lit up like daylight because my camera has caught me getting out of my truck in the driveway. Reset motion resets the exterior motion response, which is mostly used in the case that I forgot to use the exterior motion override, and then we've got controls for the exterior doors. It's also useful for when guests leave in the evening. I let the place light up when they leave so that walkways and pathways and such are well lit, but then I don't need to continue shining those floodlights into the neighbor's windows, so I always shut them off. The Wi-Fi page has a QR code for my guests to scan to get on the Wi-Fi network. And I made a video about how to set that up already, so again, check the description for a link if you want more info on that. Next up is the home audio page. This page has controls for all six zones of the whole home audio. Each zone is independently controlled and can stream music from my Plex server using Chromecasts, or you can also choose to play the radio. In addition, since these six zones are driven by three dual channel AV receivers, you can choose to sync zone two with the main zone. In the case of the laundry, the main zone is the master bedroom, or you can set it to party, which syncs it to the party channel for the rest of the house. This is very useful, obviously, if we're having a party and we want the same music everywhere. Fair warning. The detail and the code for this page, the home audio page, will be a separate video or maybe two of its own, including how it's all wired up, 
in all the automations, there are a shocking number of them, as well as the scripts I wrote to actually communicate with the receivers. So don't be expecting a ton of detail on this page during the Dashboard December series. It's just too complicated to get into for now. Sorry. Moving on, the environment page shows all the leak sensors at the top and also has controls for the thermostat. I use a Honeywell T9, which is connected via HomeKit. Then we've got historical graphs for every temperature and humidity sensor in the house. Next up is the batteries page. This page shows the status of all the batteries and all the smart home devices. I also have an automation written to send me a notification when any of them get low so that I can change them before they die. The information page is just that, information. Here we've got a quick red green to tell me if my backups are running, a few connectivity sensors for not only the internet, but also for my Plex and Blue Iris servers. You can see I was working on those Windows updates and whatnot. And then some other stuff that just didn't really have a great place for me to put it, but I still wanted that information. I already made videos for the backups and the network monitoring stuff, so check the description for links to those as well. I've got things like the control for an exterior outlet, which I'll probably move to the backyard page. Whether or not the tablet on the wall in the kitchen is charging, home and away status for both GPS and Wi-Fi trackers for the wife and I, the number of guests currently connected to my guest network, and a binary sensor for automations based on guests, if there are any high or low temp alarms, and if there are any devices with low batteries. Then we've got the switch for the light bulb in the closet with the litter boxes, as well as the motion sensor that controls that lights so my cats can see what they're doing. Next up, we've got a conditional card that displays any devices with low battery, and then a card with some general information about my home assistant deployment. Number of automations, number of sensors, cameras, device trackers, input booleans, lights, locks, media players, you get the idea. Hey, check this out though. I really liked having access to logs and reboots and whatnot right on the sidebar without having to dig through a bunch of stuff. So I put it back. We'll cover that later. All right, that's gonna wrap it up for today. Please give that like button a smack to help get my thumbnail in front of more eyeballs and be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss the rest of the upcoming videos in this exciting series. I'll be releasing a whole gaggle of them this month, each digging into a different part of my dashboard, showing you all the features in depth, going over code, the works. I don't know exactly how many they'll be just yet since I haven't finished making them all, but there'll be a bunch. The goal is to provide you guys detail behind each and every page, except the audio page, including code, so you can set this stuff up yourself if you like it. If you'd like to help support the channel and get some cool benefits, including downloadable code for all this stuff so that you don't have to pause the video and type it all in, check out my Patreon page, link in description. Thank you so much to all my current patrons. You guys kick ass. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you liked this episode's t-shirt and I hope I was able to teach you something new. Thanks for watching. And until next time, go automate something, will ya?